Well, hello and welcome to Police Watch right here on Cable 14. I'm your host, Mike Fortune. Thank you very much for tuning in. As always, it's a pleasure and honor to sit down not only with the chief, but also to get some updates from the men and women who uh, work every day for Hamilton Police Services protecting us, whether it be narcotics, uh, whether it be in the detective division, whether it be in forensic, or if it's along the streets. And that's going to bring us to Constable Chris McClure, who uh, took us on a little drive along to see what happens on the Hamilton streets on a daily basis. Here's Chris right now. I am Constable Chris McClure with the Hamilton Police Service. We're currently at Central Station in the Centralized Breath Room, which is part of support services on the traffic branch side of things. Today what we're going to be doing is heading out into the city of Hamilton. We're going to be doing some speed enforcement, looking for cell phone infractions, as well as any other Highway Traffic Act infractions. First thing we need to do though is gather our equipment, and as a breath tech and drug recognition evaluator, what I need to do at the start of the shift is ensure that the equipment that we're going to be using is functioning properly, which is the Intoxilizer 8000C. Ensure it's calibrated properly, the diagnostic checks pass, as well as the alcohol screening device, because we don't get a lot of heads up before an impaired driver is arrested and brought in by patrol. They're also calibrated every two weeks by our another officer who's certified to do the calibrations and the intoxilizer is calibrated once a week. Before we go out and do our speed enforcement, we need to check the LIDAR and ensure that it is functioning properly, that is measuring speeds properly as well as the distances. So right now we're gonna head out to um, do some enforcement, some speed enforcement in an area that is within the city limits, so it's a 50 kilometer an hour zone. It's, um, we get a lot of complaints in this area because there's a bike lane, it's heading towards the university as well as some elementary schools, and people will um, often be doing 20, 30, 40 kilometers over the speed limit. So it's a good place that we like to set up and do some enforcement. Even if we're not pulling over every driver and it's just the excessive speed ones, potentially people doing 30 or 40 kilometers over the speed limit, we still want the rest of them to see that we're out on the street. We're trying to slow them down. So the LiDAR can uh, target a vehicle. You can only target one vehicle at a time. So right now, as these vehicles are at, are at the bend, they're approximately 350 meters away that I am uh, targeting their speed. Hello, can you just do me a favor and pull in front of my vehicle for me? Thank you. In front, thank you. So this motorist is traveling 78 kilometers an hour in the 50 kilometer an hour zone. So I targeted her at 200.4 meters away in the center lane. After sitting here and watching the flow of traffic, you can gauge who's doing between 50, 55, and this vehicle looked to be doing a, a lot higher speed in the center lane, pulling away from the vehicles behind her. Hi ma'am, reason I stopped you today, speed limit is 50 kilometers an hour. You're doing 78 kilometers an hour, 28 over the speed limit. Do you have your driver's license, ownership and insurance? Are you aware of the speed limit in this zone? Yes, I am. I just, I didn't realize I was doing that. This car is so, it's, it's a new car and I just don't, sometimes I just don't see it sense the speed in it. We have discretion as officers, as if you want to give someone a verbal warning, if we're going to issue a ticket for, in the case of speeding, for the full, full amount. So this uh, driver is traveling at 28 kilometers over the speed limit. The fine is $135 and the ministry will add three points to her license. She'll accumulate if I write the full amount. The reason for looking at the driving abstract is to determine if this motorist has had reductions in the past. Uh, in this case, this motorist hasn't had a uh, speeding ticket since 2012. She's had some other speeding tickets as well as some moving violation, um, provincial offense notices. Her last speeding ticket was for 65 kilometers in a 50 kilometer an hour zone. That tells me that that ticket has been reduced 
as I'm seeing that in her other tickets uh, prior to that, 65 and a 50 zone, 65 and a 50 zone. What I've done for you is I've reduced this speeding ticket for you. There's no points that you're accumulating on your license. Instead of over a $100 fine, it's $52.50. I do have to advise you that that R, because it's uh, reduced, it tells the prosecutor that if you do challenge it, no, you're not, not challenge no, you're entitled to do that. I'm just explaining to you, you're not challenging the 15 over, you have to challenge the 28 over. Okay, yeah. no, I'm just, not sorry, no, I just, just please slow down, yeah, be no, safe. So my main responsibility is, as a breath tech, any impaired drivers that are arrested by myself, patrol, or sometimes other agencies, such as OPP, whenever an impaired driver is arrested, they have to come before me uh, for additional testing, gathering of further evidence to support the impaired driving charge. So that's my, uh, both by alcohol and or drug, that's my sole responsibility. When I'm not conducting drug or alcohol testing. I'm expected to be out conducting enforcement, looking around for other violations, possibly cell phones, administration violations, which may be validation stickers that are not um, up to date. Sometimes something as simple as a validation sticker being expired, you may get a hit back on the driver that they're suspended, disqualified, wanted. Uh, there's a number of things that come back and some investigations start with something as simple as a traffic stop. So to be a breath tech, you need to be trained on using the intoxilizer, which is an instrument that's um, developed in the States out of Kentucky. You need to be trained on how the instrument works. There's a lot of science behind it, how to calibrate it, making sure that the diagnostics checks are working properly, and how to gather the appropriate evidence from it. With the Hamilton Police Service, you also need to be a drug recognition evaluator. The program is two weeks at the Ontario Police College, in which you become proficient on the science behind evaluating for what different drug classes um, do to the body on consumption. After you finish that two-week portion at the Ontario Police College, you then need to go down to the, run the second part of the program out of Jacksonville, Florida. You have two days where you're in a clinic where people are brought in and they're impaired by drug and you need to take all of the content that you've learned and all the science, and you're conducting physical testing as well as clinical testing with a subject to determine what drug class or multiple drug classes they've consumed. So in Hamilton, you need to be both be a breath tech and a drug recognition evaluator to be in the centralized breath unit. I got into policing for um, Similar reasons to some, yet uh, different than most. Um, I'm actually fourth generation uh, in the police profession, so I was around policing growing up and was always interested in it. I really enjoy helping people, which uh, policing was not my first career. Uh, prior to policing, I was a teacher, fifth grade, special ed teacher in New York City in Harlem and the projects. It had its challenges, um, but it made me want to get into policing. I had some kids in my class, um, the majority of the school, the kids and their families were below the poverty line. And I had some kids that were getting um, assaulted by their parents. I had some kids in my class that were responsible as 10 year olds for taking care of their younger siblings because their parents were not around. Uh, so there's some dynamics there. I, I wanted to be on the other side of helping those kids and helping people. So we are currently on Nikola Tesla Boulevard. It can be a little misleading and it's, it's no longer the QEW. It's not an extension of the QEW. It's a posted, currently where we are, 60 kilometer an hour zone. When you come off the QEW, it's a 70 kilometer an hour zone. 
So where we currently are is at uh, the Kenilworth off-ramp and I will position myself just outside my cruiser door and again I'm looking for vehicles that are traveling at a much higher rate of speed than the other ones. So I need to make sure that I don't affect traffic when I pull back out. So in front of me, in the passing lane, I have a white BMW SUV. It was closing on the traffic in front of it at a very high rate of speed. So I targeted the front of the vehicle. It was also passing vehicles in the curb lane. It's traveling at a speed of 92 kilometers an hour, and again, it's a 60 kilometer an hour zone. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wait until an appropriate time, follow behind the vehicle until it's safe to stop it, that I don't affect the traffic around me, and also it's somewhere safe for me to exit the vehicle, speak with the driver. So you're doing 32 kilometers over the speed limit. You have your driver's license, ownership, and insurance? So this uh, motorist is doing 32 kilometers over the speed limit. Uh, inside his vehicle, he has a built-in GPS, which I asked him about if it shows the speed limit in the area, and he advised that it does. So therefore, if he's looking down, it'd be showing him that it's 60 kilometers an hour, as well as the posted signs that he passed. Uh, looking at his driving abstract, he hasn't had any recent, since 2013, any speeding tickets in which time he was given a, looks like a reduced ticket for 40 over the speed limit. So he must have been stunt driving and the officer used some discretion. He's been cooperative with me. Um, so I'll most likely be using some discretion with him. Appreciate your patience. You. So what I've done for you, I've provided you with a reduced provincial offense notice. Okay, so instead of 32 over the speed limit, you're being written a province, provincial offense notice for 15 over the speed limit. Instead of a $232 ticket and four points being added to your license by the ministry, it's a $52.50 ticket and no points will be added to your license. Thank you. you just, Let me ask you a question. Yes. How long do they speed? Because once I realize they're going fast, I try to slow down. Yeah. Did I speed for a long time? Did you feel like so, the reason, so did you see where I was standing? Yes. Sir. Okay. So when you came around the corner, there was a car in front of you. You were closing the distance on that car in front of you. It tells me you're going at a faster speed than the cars around you. There was also a car in the curb lane right, yes. yep, that you were also passing. So you're traveling at a higher rate of speed. I targeted you. I get a speed reading at that point that I decide to target the front of your car. You slowed down after that once you passed me, but I wasn't going to stop you up on that upper bowl because it's not safe for me to conduct a traffic stop. I just want to understand because that, that, that corner, it's always difficult to adjust your speed properly. Yes. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to find a reason. I, I really want to do the right thing. I'm just giving you some feedback. So you came in off the QEW? Yes. I okay. Came the QEW. When, when you come off the QEW, there's 70 kilometer an hour posted signs. You would have passed approximately five 70 kilometer an hour signs before you get to Strathern. At Strathern, there's a 60 begin sign. It's still before you get to me. You then pass one more 60 sign before you come around that corner. So if you're doing 92, you were actually speeding since you came off the QEW. So, so that's, that's uh, several hundred meters, uh, even close to 2,000 meters worth of distance that you were covering, doing, you were doing more than the speed limit. So that's a sneak peek in the day of a centralized breath tech drug recognition evaluator when we're not conducting impaired driving tests. I hope you enjoyed and learned a little bit about speed enforcement and what it is that we do when we're doing enforcement throughout the city of Hamilton. And again, a big thanks to Constable uh, Chris McClure there. I'm joined now by Chief Eric Gert. And what a wonderful behind the scenes look at traffic enforcement, breathalyzer, and the fact that he also has to mention, he also has to be a drug uh, recognition enforcer as well. Uh, so articulate, well-spoken, and the things that they have to look for and be aware of while they're traveling on the streets. And, and you used to do traffic yourself, so you're aware of all this. I did traffic and I was a breathalyzer technician as well. He's actually both a breathalyzer technician and a drug evaluation, or sorry, drug recognition evaluator. Mm -hmm. So to your point, uh, it's all about traffic safety. It's not just speeding, it's not just distracted driving, it's impaired driving either by drugs or alcohol. 
So you saw the whole suite of things that he says he's out and looking for. And when we have dedicated traffic officers who do that piece, they're not necessarily answering calls for service. But when we look at last year, we had, you know, 17 fatals. Um, that's significant, that's 17 deaths. Mm -hmm. And were we to have, and roughly fall in that bar ballpark for homicides too, uh, you know, the collateral damage to the families, all the things that happen as a result of a death, it's equal that way. Uh, so whether, now, obviously death by violent means in a homicide has some other implications, but death by violent means in a vehicle collision also has. So it's important in terms of the traffic safety, road safety, and you can see Chris's level of articulation to the public, but what he's doing, when he's asked and questioned about, you know, where did you first see me, he provides that answer. Um, he's polite and courteous, but he's factual. Uh, these are all, in my view, requirements to do that job because it can't just be, you know, driver's license, ownership, and insurance. Mm -hmm. You have to explain to the people why, why you were stopping them, what drew your attention in the first place, and uses, you saw it, it's driving behavior. Then he turns the LiDAR equipment on which is that uh, laser evaluation for speed, and then he provides what has happened. Then if it goes to court, that's fine. Mm -hmm. There shouldn't be any surprises because the person's been told. I think an explanation is so key because as he also alluded to, it's up to his discretion. And if you're one of those drivers that start to get into the face of an officer, we've talked about this and, and we've seen it, that's not helping your case at all. The facts are the facts. I got you on the gun right here. They are, and I mean, people are entitled to the opinions. I understand mm -hmm. that. But if we're looking at, you know, and the courts would consider this, does a person admit, do they demonstrate remorse? And you don't have to, I'm not saying you have to, uh, but, you know, it weighs into the equation and you saw him exercise his discretion. And that discretion has been established in the case law that officers are allowed to do that because we'll sometimes get, well, why don't you just give me the full amount? I'm exercising discretion. And in the interest of traffic safety, if I get compliance from the person and they slow down, that's what I'm aiming for. I'm also fascinated on how far out he can actually track you. I made a note here, up to 350 meters away. This, the one particular vehicle I think was 205, give or take. So by the time you see your, the officer in a gun, there's no point in slamming on your brake. He's already has his eyes on you if, if you were the car that was targeted. And by slamming on your brakes or trying to slow down too quickly, you could potentially have an accident behind you as well. You said it. And just so you know, when uh, the equipment first came out, I know we went out to Dundas, and we almost got a vehicle at a kilometer, but you have to have a large object. Mm -hmm. So the, the range he's talking, 350 meters, but you can be up to 750 meters. That's three quarters of a kilometer. Mm -hmm. uh, you would have to have a singular vehicle in the beam, be able to properly identify it. And as I say, a larger object is easier to uh, target the system with. So uh, yes, great distance when we get. Um, just let's stay on the traffic things. I've seen some police media releases come through over the last little while. I'm not talking about specifics, but there's road rage that's still out there. There are the fail to remains. Um, any rhyme or reason with your long history of policing and what you see, what you hear, why these things kind of escalate, why people feel that they can get away and not stick around after, after doing something? Well, there's a number of reasons people will leave the scene, but you obviously are obligated to uh, stop, provide name, uh, insurance information, render assistance, um, those type of things. That doesn't mean you have to provide CPR, but if you're phoning 911, it's certainly helpful. Um, so I, I can't step into the mind of somebody who panics and leaves. Sometimes they come back. Uh, sometimes they will try and uh, get the car repaired or otherwise. Um, and you can see in the latest cases that we're working with, often we will have video uh, often we will get a license plate, you know, sometimes it's stolen or it might not be. Um, there's other ways to do it. So you certainly don't want to be in the end of an interview uh, when somebody comes to knock on your door and then ends up seizing the property, yeah, there's an investigation. Certainly doesn't, it's a compounding factor when you get to court. Relative to the driving behavior, that is quite complex. We've talked about it a lot. Mm -hmm. But I guess my comment would go to uh, when we were out at town halls, and that's whether I'm the chief or whether I was at division, when I'm on other uh, shows, uh, the leading issue that we deal with is traffic safety because most people are impacted by it, often in their own neighborhoods. So whether it's stop sign violations, red light tickets, you've talked about aggressive driving, speeding, distracted driving, we hear a lot about that. Um, there's a sentiment among the public that something needs to be done. As you know, we uh, were funded through the city to do enforcement on both the Red Hill and Lincoln Alexander, but predominantly Red Hill, but they're connected. Um, and we've seen the results of that, which in my view is reduction of accidents, reduction of personal injury accidents, and reduction in fatals. So it was a combined effort. There's engineering changes. There was uh, enforcement and education. 
but sometimes it requires the enforcement. You saw the reaction of the people here to get the message across. So we're still big on it. We have done enforcement for all our members throughout the service. Uh, but as you can see, the merits of a traffic uh, office that's dedicated to both the enforcement, the road rage, the distracted driving, and then really in many ways almost as serious uh, or more serious as the impaired driving. Of course, uh, and, and that impaired can be either through alcohol or, as we've talked about so much lately, through, through uh, drugs or other types of uh, cannabis and all that. Um, you touched on the year-end stats. Um, was that kind of a final number? Was there anything else that you kind of wanted to highlight there, Chief? Well, our, our enforcement has gone up 4.5% uh, from okay. uh, 2018. Uh, we had no alcohol-related fatal collisions in 2019. That versus yeah versus five in 2018 okay um, that's on the red hill and uh more impaired by drug charges in 2019 versus 2018 mm. so we're up from 48 in 2018 to 61 in 2019 and i've talked about it yeah. some of it is awareness from our officers because they're all uh, field sobriety test trained uh, sfst and then also and you talked about we've been using the drug uh, recognition evaluator for a number of years now and Chris talked about on the tape, they're both trained on the breathalyzer and the drug recognition evaluation, which is a very detailed course. And of course, they have to find out uh, what is the type of drug, establish that, be able to verify it. Uh, it's, it's very uh, extensive training for physiology, for uh, the physical effects, what they look for. Um, but we think it's important to invest in that because of the, the road safety and the traffic safety. So uh, yeah, they do a, a heck of a job. And we've also got the collision reconstruction unit, and you alluded to some failed rain collisions. When we have a fatality or serious accident, that's who will do that investigation. Yeah, and, and again, though that is so detailed information too. And of course, everything that's going on at the, the uh, Red Hill Valley Parkway and all that, reconstruction and what's happening, but that's a whole other can of worms. Um, the completion of the investigative services building. Uh, this has been a long time coming. I know mm -hmm. Hamilton Police Services is very excited about this. Yeah. Talk to us about this, Chief. Yeah, so really, if you, you put it in a nutshell, we moved from labs that were originally designed in the 1970s. <laughs> of course, we've made amendments and changes to assist with the continuity, because you have to establish uh, continuity in court for any exhibit you handle. Two really best practice right now is four labs. Um, one for the victim, one for the accused, one for the scene, and an extra lab, depending on what you're uh, working on. Uh, high uh, requirements in terms of the HVAC, uh, ensuring that the environment is pristine, that you don't have cross-contamination. But again, forensics is one of the centerpieces in the investigative services building, but it's all of investigative services. So for example, we had an opportunity in designing this particular building to consider the needs of survivors and victims coming in for interviews, whether it's sexual assault or child abuse, mm -hmm. uh, so that they're not kind of walking through the main corridor and if you've been to Central, uh, it's a you know, wide variety of people there for um, different reasons. Some could be vulnerable screening, screening checks or getting property back, whatever. So we've been conscious of that in the design and also uh, certainly for tech crime, when you look at the proliferation of digital evidence now, and you know, in 10 years, I don't even know how large it'll get. It's huge currently. I've talked about a digital tsunami previously. We have to handle and download all those exhibits. The bonus for us is, and you can see it, whether it's video evidence from a stationary video, phone evidence, or other electronic evidence, it really assists us in the investigation. So proper handling of that, um, ensuring the device is not uh, affected by some external source, all the requirements to do that and then actually analyze the data. <clears throat> it's becoming significant and that will also be done within that building. So we're really excited. It's on track probably April or May this year. That's only a couple of months behind schedule and you get that with any project. But currently we're on budget and currently we're within about three months of the original anticipated completion time. And, and then once finally opening, obviously this is going to be state of the art. Um, what are some of the key features that you can touch upon? I know you talked about the layout and, and, and so on and so forth. Are there any key features you can touch on or at least let us know that uh, you're not letting the cat out of the bag? Well, no, and, and really it's more about the architecture okay. and how it fits into the workflow within mm -hmm. any work environment. So we've been cognizant about the synergies within that building, who works together, what is the flow of information, the handling of exhibits, uh, security, as I say, um, certainly how uh, victims and survivors are interviewed, um, transport of accused persons, how does that work? There's quite a bit that goes into the building that the public may or may not see. 
Um, but largely, it really is moving it forward to see how can we work better within the work environment. Uh, the big requirements were obviously the forensics lab and tech crime. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, we got a, a, just a couple minutes left. Uh, recruiting. Um, there's been a change on how people can now apply. I'd like you to touch on that, please, Chief. Yeah, so the constable selection system in the Ministry of the Solicitor General kind of got out of the business. Uh, the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police stepped forward. We're looking for consistency uh, across the province. It's a work in progress. Uh, but we have moved now to an OACP certificate online. We're trying to make it easier uh, because we're addressing not just needs here in Hamilton, but rural communities. Uh, often the testing that's required, what had to happen in a remote location, how often would that happen? So we're trying to get ahead of that. Uh, look for reliability of those tests, and uh, some are both um, uh, aptitude tests as well as uh, personality profiles. Uh, and looking at, and that's usually standard practice within any tests that we previously did. Uh, so it's the evolution of that. And as you know, we're always recruiting. I got a chance last time to talk about recruiting. Uh, you can see from Chris. So Chris is talking about his experience as a teacher in New York having a desire to make a more significant change in relation to uh, the violent acts that he'd seen with kids or kids just left on their own. Uh, we do have that capacity to have interactions and address some of those issues. Sometimes you don't see the results for years, uh, but I think Chris recognized that some of the interventions we can have are significant. If you have an interest in doing that, and I've talked about the two key pieces, you have to like dealing with people. You also have like to have either problem solving or problem managing, because sometimes we can't eliminate the problem, but we can manage it so that you have harm reduction and lesser impacts on people. Yeah, people skills, emotional intelligence, boy, there you th go. those are things that can't be taught Correct. to some extent. Uh, Chief, thank you very much. Again, your open uh, op openness and transparency is always greatly appreciated. When you see Chris, let him know he did a bang up job. I will. It was fantastic. And as I always like to say, please be safe and continue success to everyone down at HPS. Thank you very much. Great Appreciate seeing you again, Chief. Okay. okay, there you have it. Chief Eric Gert joining us right here on Police Watch. That's gonna wrap up this episode. We hope that you've learned just a little bit more about what goes on behind the Hamilton Police Services. And if you're out on those roads, you be careful. Someone might be watching. You don't wanna be pulled over with those radar guns. We've given you all the information. I'm Mike Fortune, Hamilton. Stay safe, look after yourself. We'll see you next time. Take care.